Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Good afternoon, I guess. Good midday, uh, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Ashley Lukens. I'm a jack of all trades here at Center for Food Safety. Happy to be facilitating this webinar today. We'd love it if you would drop your name and where you're Zooming in from in the chat, just so we know who's in the Zoom. Um, and we're gonna get started in a few minutes. So again, name and where you're Zooming in from in the chat. And um, we are excited to have you guys here. Hi, Sylvia from Irvine. Marsha from Santa Cruz, Kathy in Alaska, Rob from Palm Bay, Florida, Kirsten from Asheville. I love Asheville. Um, so great to have you guys join us. We had a ton of registrations for this webinar, so we're really grateful um, to be here with you all. Um, Aloha, Anne from Silver Spring. Gigi from Tucson, another Marsha. Hi, Marsha from Juneau. Hello from Chicago, David. Nice to see you guys. So grateful to have you here. Oh, John Mendoza from Toppenish Creek. Nice to see you, Jean. Jean. Hi, Jean. Um, so great to have you guys here joining us again. <clears throat> My name is Ashley Lukens. I'm a regional development director for the Center for Food Safety. I'll be facilitating our conversation um, today and we'll get started in one to two minutes. And if you're just joining us, we're just writing our name and where we are Zooming in from in the chat. Um, I'd love to turn it over to our development manager, Brenna Norton right now, who's gonna talk about some really cool features we'll have on the webinar today. Thanks, Ashley. Um, hi, all. Brenna here. Just we wanted to let you know we have an exciting new feature we were able to implement for today's webinar. If you feel so inspired during our call today and you would like to support our organization financially, you can actually give right on the webinar live. Uh, we'll put a link in the chat where you can donate. You can also text uh, stop pesticides to 707070. And you don't need to memorize any of this. We'll put it all in the chat. Um, and you can also see a screen on the webinar with the information. And we'll also show us how much we've raised during the webinar today. Uh, thanks so much for your support. We couldn't do our work without you. Yep, that's definitely true. We're so grateful to the thousands upon thousands of folks who donate to the Center for Food Safety um, every year. And we'll go into this throughout the webinar, but our litigation wouldn't be possible without the donations from our members. We do not charge our clients. We do all of this work free of charge to the community. And so it is your donations that help power the litigation that um, is helping us protect our entire planet um, from the kinds of chemicals that are integral to the industrial agriculture system. I'm very proud to be joined today by three of my favorite colleagues, uh, Andrew Kimbrell, the Executive Director of Center for Food Safety, Amy Van Swan, le uh, Senior Legal, Senior Attorney, uh, and Bill Fries, our scientists, chief scientists. So thank you guys for joining us today. Um, you know, I joined the Center for Food Safety back in 2014, way back then. And our work at that point was sort of internationally known for a focus on genetically modified organisms or GMOs. Um, and today our webinar is on pesticides. So I thought a great place to start would be helping folks understand what is the connection between genetically engineered crops and pesticides. Bill, you wanna take a stab at that? Sure, sure, Ashley, thanks. Yeah, it's good to be here uh, and welcome everyone. I guess, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I've been involved in this issue since 
Oh, just before the turn of the century, 1999. So 2014, actually, that doesn't seem long at all to me. Um, I, I started at CFS in 2006. And, you know, I guess the, the link between GMOs and pesticides, it's really interesting because, you know, basically these big, you know, biotech companies, Monsanto, Dow, Syngenta, <clears throat> they, the first GMO, well, okay, when you go back to the beginning, right, they're, they're basically chemical companies, they're agrochemical companies. And what happened is in the 80s and 90s, they began buying up seed firms, right, just hundreds of different seed firms around the country. And so what we call biotech companies today are really, you know, big major pesticide companies that have, you know, added on this whole seed division. And so the whole technology of genetic engineering came of age in the, you know, in the 80s and 90s. And so their whole plan from the beginning was to use this technology to engineer crops for pest management. First came the BT crops, so-called, and these are the corn and cotton varieties that I'm sure you've heard about that produce an insecticidal toxin in their tissues, throughout their tissues. So in the grain of corn, for instance, you'll have this toxin. And when insects try to, to eat the leaves of the plant, the toxins in the leaves too, it'll, it'll die. So that was a focus of our early concern, but then much more prominent has, has been the other major category of GMOs and that's the herbicide resistant crops. And these are basically GMOs that have been engineered to withstand direct application of weed killers <clears throat> um, or herbicides as they're often called. And herbicides are one form of pesticide, which is kind of the umbrella category. So, Basically, yeah, herbicides had, had always previously been, you know, farmers had had to use them very carefully, right? Because as plant killing compounds, they not only kill weeds, they also can kill your crop, right? So you had to be careful and apply them maybe only at the beginning of the year or, you know, you know very carefully during the season. Um, with the herbicide resistant crops, they basically have a gene from a bacteria that has evolved resistance to the herbicide. Okay, these are soil bacteria. A lot of them, get this, are found, they were discovered outside the grounds of the herbicide manufacturing plant, all right? So you have glyphosate outside and glyphosate is the active ingredient in Roundup. And so you have glyphosate outside the grounds of a glyphosate plant and the bacteria just over generations, they evolved resistance. They plucked that gene basically, and put it into the crops and made soybeans, corn, cotton, and other crops resistant to glyphosate. And that's led to a huge increase in the use of these herbicides, which is very beneficial to these companies because they, they kind of, you know, uh, they, they have, they make a double killing. They sell the GMO seeds at a premium, and then they also sell the companion herbicides that go with them. Um, so that's, that's basically, you know, the connection, I think, and it explains a lot. It explains why GMOs are not about feeding the world. They're not a humanitarian enterprise, as I'm sure a lot of you already understand. Uh, but that was a very strong kind of message and hype that the companies put out there at the dawn of the GMO era. And I like to think that we've helped kind of shift the, the narrative on these crops and, you know, through our work. Yeah, I remember when we were <clears throat> actively engaged in community-based litigation here in Hawaii, it was a huge aha for me to understand that GMOs are what have facilitated the um, rising rates of herbicides in our food supply. Um, never before had we been able to eat herbicides and it, genetically engineered crops are what enabled that. Um, Andy, I thought this might be a moment for you to kind of help us shift out to the broader paradigm um, within which pesticides and genetically engineered crops become pillars of a food system. Yeah, well, it's always been, uh, thank you, Ashley, and welcome everyone. And um, yeah, I mean, the whole, you no, know, it was so shocking for us all those years ago when I got involved in this in, gosh, the late 80s. Uh, so <laughs> there you go. Um, that uh, you know, to see aerial spraying of these herbicides, as, as, you know, as, as Bill was saying, you know, you have to be very careful about herbicides because they didn't just want to just kill your weeds, but kill your crop. But here you can aerial spray 
because they the crops have been genetically engineered, as Bill's explaining, to resist it. What a shocking thing. And that is, this has always been about chemical companies selling more chemicals. It's always been that way, despite the years and years of propaganda, as, as Bill was saying. But there is the larger picture that you mentioned, and, and it's, um, it's, it's extraordinary, really, because behind it all is this, what would you call it? Denial, delusion, uh, is this idea that we could exterminate those things that don't fit the industrial agriculture system and that we could do so per it permanently, right? So the idea is that we could just use all this barrage of chemicals, this blanket of chemicals to kill the weeds or insects or fungi that we didn't think were desirable. And that would, that would they would never get resistance. They would ne that was just fine. So it was a delusion of eradication. It was this myth of eradication that the entire, and the entire system is based on it. The entire industrial system is based on it, right? It reminds me a little of antibiotics, right? The whole idea is you have a, a, a bacteria you don't like, you kill all the bacteria through antibiotics. And that would be fine. We could do that forever. No, we can't. Nature bats last, not biotechnology. And so what we found is, and this is across the country, right? Massive development of resistance in these, we in these weeds, right? I mean, pigweed is almost entirely resistant at this point to Roundup. You can't even knock that over with a combine. They're so thick. So this is a tremendous problem for the entire industrial system is these resistant weeds, just like resistant bacteria for our health resistant fungi. They have adapted. And the amazing thing is in the late 90s, Monsanto went before Congress and said there's an enzyme in Roundup that somehow will make it not susceptible to resistance. The weeds will never develop resistance to it. So this is like second grade science. No, they will. It's called microevolution, and we're never going to have enough chemistry to defeat nature. So when you look at the big picture, if it wasn't so horribly tragic, not just for our health, but the health of the rest of the Earth community and the Earth itself and Earth microbes, there's almost a humor to it that somehow we'd have these companies and scientists buying the ludicrous idea that we could use these chemicals permanently to get rid of all these other aspects of nature and that they wouldn't develop resistance. Well, they have. We're at peak herbicides right now. We don't have a broad spectrum herbicide like Roundup. We're going backwards to dicamba and to 2,4-D, which we'll talk about. We're going back to the old ones because there are no new ones. Same with fungicides. So th this isn't some juggernaut that's going into the future, right? The uh, nature through its microevolution is already defeating this paradigm. This is a dead paradigm walking. <laughs> we can't eradicate our way for, to an industrial system forever. It is collapsing and it will collapse. Our job is to hopefully get rid of it as quickly as we can through our litigation and education and all the work we do because it's it's a zombie paradigm, but it's like all zombies, it can still eat your brains, right? It can still destroy everything it's destroying, but there's no future. The future is agroecology. The future is organic and regenerative agriculture. It has to be, right? That's just the science. So stopping the industrial system involves a huge variety of strategies, but what we're best at is litigation. Amy, I'm wondering if you can talk broadly about what our litigation work does. I think there's been a lot of information in the news about Monsanto losing millions upon millions of dollars in court. How does our litigation fit into that work and how is it different? Well, in our work, we generally are going to our government and trying to get them to actually follow the laws that we already have on the books that protect us or are supposed to protect us and wildlife from these poisons. Um, so we're going, the litigation we use is trying to do a kind of more systemic approach to actually improving the regulation of these things and stopping them before they go out onto the market. Uh, as opposed to remediating the damage or getting compensation for the damage after it happens. Um, you know, it, it's great that Bayer slash Monsanto is having to pay out, but no amount of money can bring someone back once they've passed away from cancer. So our hope is to improve the regulatory system and ideally pass new laws that will actually strengthen the laws we have and to hold our government accountable to protecting us since it is in fact our government that is supposed to be protecting us and not the profits of Monsanto and, and friends. Um, 
And so more specifically, uh, a lot of times we're suing EPA, which is uh, the agency in charge of approving pesticides under our federal pesticide law. And uh, we're challenging them when they either approve new pesticides, uh, which as uh, Andy already said, is, is less and less frequent. Um, at, and when they approve or reissue approvals of older pesticides. Uh, often this is for you know, um, continued or even new uses in the case of dicamba, which is a very old pesticide, but that now we have newly engineered crops that can resist it. So it was a, um, a new, much broader use of that older pesticide. So we will take EPA to court and um, under uh, several, several of our federal laws, one of which of course is the Endangered Species Act, which is you know, a precautionary uh, law that says, hey, federal government, when you do something, you have to make sure you're not jeopardizing the existence of species that are on the brink of extinction. Um, and so that is something that EPA has to do before it, it go ahead and, and approves these biocides. Uh, it, it hasn't in for many decades. And so us, as well as other organizations, have, have brought so many lawsuits against EPA. And you know, consistently, EPA is told by the court, you need to do this. Um, so that's, you know, part of part of our, our work is to um, keep hammering them and advancing the law while we do that to get, you know, good decisions that um, change the precedent. So that means that EPA has to follow that going forward. Yeah, it, it I remember how clearly I understood the importance of uh, government regulation when we here in Hawaii were dealing with pesticide drift from these field trials where they were testing these new dicamba resistant crops, Roundup resistant, 2,4-D resistant crops. And a neighbor can't go to a farm next door and say, hey, I'm gonna, I want you to stop this drift. Only the government can do that. And that's why I think changes in regulation matter so much in the lives of the people that have to work in fields where these chemicals are sprayed, who live nearby where these chemicals are sprayed. It's, it is different than the kind of personal injury litigation that's getting um, so much news. I wanna hone in for a second for folks on the pesticide dicamba, because I know we're in the midst of some really important litigation. Bill, can you tell us a little bit about dicamba and where, what the status of that pesticide is and our litigation? Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, dicamba is, as uh, Amy said, an older herbicide. It was first introduced in the 1960s. And um, it wasn't, it's never been used that much, at least for most of its history, because it's very prone to volatilize and drift. And volatilize means essentially just convert from a solid or liquid form directly to gas. And uh, it's a particularly um, you know, nasty form of drift, right? You can have spray drift, which can happen with pretty much any pesticide. And that's when you know, the wind is blowing and the farmer or applicator is spraying, the pesticide can, can get caught up in the wind and then you know, damage crops for you know, hundreds of feet, say, from the, the place that's being sprayed. But volatilization is, is much worse. It can lead to damage miles away. So um, basically, this herbicide dicamba, you know, it's never been used that much, precisely because of this, this volatility drift issue. And then um, what happened was that, you know, when Monsanto had this Roundup resistant weed problem that, that we've talked about, you know, on over 120 million acres of cropland, um, there was there needed to be some you know uh, solution, some profitable solution. So Monsanto decided to engineer crops that are resistant to dicamba as well as glyphosate. And in 2017, these crops first hit the field, and farmers began spraying dicamba like they never had before. And the drift has just been. In, I mean, it's been basically, we've had long time agricultural scientists who are saying we've never seen anything like this in the history of agriculture, all right? In the entire history of agriculture, never have we seen millions of acres of crops being, you know, damaged. You know, some slightly, but some like really seriously. Soybeans, all kinds of fruits and vegetables, 
There was a farmer in Southeast Missouri whose entire peach orchard was decimated by multiple repeated drift episodes. Um, so yeah, it's just been, you know, a really unprecedented kind of, you know, problem for agriculture that even mainstream agronomists who are typically very pesticide friendly have been pretty horrified by. So yeah, we've uh, been, you know, fighting this now. We filed a lawsuit, as Amy said, right after the dicamba use for these particular crops, these resistant crops was approved. And um, that, you know, eventually led to our victory that I think, you know, maybe Amy can talk about better than I can, but it, you know, basically it was a real, I think a really significant victory because it, I'll just say that the judges understood clearly our arguments and accepted them, which is, you know, has to do with just the drift prone nature of this herbicide and how much damage it caused and how EPA had violated federal law by not considering the costs of this drift, right? EPA nowhere says, oh, these farmers were injured. That's a cost that we need to account for when we, you know, make our decisions. That's what, you know, federal pesticides federal pesticide law requires them to do, but they've never done it. And one of the really, really groundbreaking features of our decision, and I'm stepping on Amy's toes here a little bit, is the fact that we, we got a federal court to, you know, to agree with us that yes, yet you have to look at these economic costs from drift, the harm that's caused to other farmers, and not only that, but also the social costs. Because what's happened with all of this damage out there in farm country is, it's engendered tremendous strife between farmers, between those who are spraying dicamba, um, because it does kill weeds, and those who are injured by it. And you know, it's even led to like a gunshot death in one case in in southern Missouri, which is just really tragic. But you know, many many other instances of you know just people at each other's throats, families that have been friendly, you know, forever going back generations, are now you know enemies. And that's, that's the kind of, you know, cost that EPA now has to take into account and we have to make sure that they do. Amy, I'd love to turn it over to you and have you help folks understand where dicamba fits into our broader sort of recent series of wins around pesticides. Sure, and I'll say that uh, you know, Bill, you've been working with lawyers long enough that you you you, you nailed the uh, description of why that was an important legal victory. Um, so, you know, backing up a little bit, the the federal pesticide law, uh, federal insecticide, fungicide, and rodenticide act, which no one ever wants to say the full name of, or FIFRA for short, is. Um, you know, it has some good standards in it, in that it's a law that says, EPA, you need to look at the, the adverse effects of these pesticides before you approve them or register them. And if that's if there's more adverse effects than not basically uh, un unreasonable or unacceptable adverse effects, then don't register it. However, so that, you know, it's good. It's a cautionary pre-market um, review. Problem is it also builds in other kinds of analyses, like what are the benefits of this pesticide? And you know, says EPA, you can't refuse to register something just because we already have one that's similar. So it's led to registrations of thousands and thousands of active ingredients, even more than that in products that incorporate those active ingredients. And so we just have this flood of, of so many types of pesticides. Of course, some are much more highly used than others, um, glyphosate or Roundup most highly used pesticide in the country, I think in the world. And then neonicotinoids um, are the, these you know, systemic insecticides, they're neurotoxin, um, that's how they kill insects and also birds and fish and other aquatic invertebrates, um, they're, 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 they're highly toxic. Uh, that's sort of the, uh, another really big uh, category of pesticides. So when we bring cases, we're bringing them under both that FIFRA, that federal law, and um, typically under the Endangered Species Act, which I mentioned earlier, which requires EPA before it registers these pesticides, you know, while it's doing its uh, FIFRA review of the costs and benefits of a pesticide, it also needs to make sure that it's not going to harm endangered species, and it needs to consult with the expert federal agencies 
uh, who are the bio biology and wildlife experts uh, about what those impacts would be. And so sometimes we win on one or the other uh, type claims. So in one of our victories that I was involved in kind of in the beginning of when I joined Center for Food Safety uh, was our case in Ellis uh, or a case on two um, many products in, including two of the largest use active ingredients uh, that are neonicotinoids. And so we brought that case on behalf of beekeepers as well as conservation groups. And what we won was our Endangered Species Act claim. And uh, because EPA just hadn't done its job, it hadn't consulted and it had been approving all these products and just sending them out the door without looking at whether they would harm endangered species. And there were so many different species of butterflies, um, aquatic invertebrates, like I mentioned before, dragonflies, you know, all kinds of um, uh, species that would be harmed. Birds, uh, again, you know, uh, one seed coated in a neonic uh, can kill a songbird. So they're really toxic. And um, so we won that case and we, we had a settlement with EPA and the pesticide companies, which both took some of the products off the market, which was a novel new thing that has never really happened. And EPA agreed to do a nationwide consultation um, to look at the impacts of endangered species from those active ingredients. So not just the products that we sued on, but the entire active ingredient, um, which is a much bigger deal. And actually the drafts of those just came out showing widespread adverse effect, likely harm um, to, to thousands of endangered species. So unsurprisingly, but once EPA actually does the work and looks at it, it can see what those costs and those harms are. And then it can actually decide, oh, should we really approve this pesticide or should we, or, you know, don't approve it at all or approve it with like much, much more strict conditions. So that's what we aim to do. Um, and, and so in that case, uh, we, we won in, in the endangered species context. In the dicamba case, we really pushed the FIFRA law forward as Bill already described. Bill, maybe you can, we can hone in a little bit on monarchs because I know that a lot of our pesticide litigation has had a profound impact on monarchs. Can you talk about the work that we've been doing to protect monarchs and how it relates to pesticides? Yeah, that's that that's really a good a good question, and I think it it began when um, oh man, I, I forget how long ago now, at least a decade ago, when I had you know really begun digging into the whole Roundup Ready problem, right? And I had focused pretty heavily on all of this use of Roundup or glyphosate to um, on, on these Roundup Ready crops, which had led to the superweed epidemic. And I was really focused in on, on the weed issue and how the, all these weeds were evolving resistance to this herbicide. And then I got an email from um, someone who alerted me to a paper about how the same herbicide glyphosate or Roundup was uniquely effective at killing milkweed, all right? And, milkweed, as I'm sure a lot of you know, is the, the sole host plant for monarch butterflies. So, you know, if you're a monarch butterfly and you're looking for food and a, a, and a place to reproduce, it's like, it's, it's milkweed or nothing, right? That's, that's what they require to, you know, survive. So they'll lay their eggs on milkweed plants, the caterpillars hatch and feed on, on the milkweed. And <clears throat> the Basically, what, what's really interesting with milkweed is that a lot of it uh, historically has been found in farm fields, in corn and soybean fields, precisely in the Midwest, which is the major breeding ground for monarch butterflies, right? So here you have this, this plant that's essential for monarchs. Um, a good half of it, at least, is found in corn and soybean fields. And it had survived because most herbicides and even tillage was not, you know, that effective at killing it. Milkweed's a really tough plant. It has long roots. It's a perennial. So it had survived, you know, industrial agriculture up until Roundup Ready crops were introduced. And then this massive increase in the use of Roundup, which, you know, is, is very good at killing perennial plants like milkweed, caused devastation. It basically, you know, took out nearly all of the milkweed from corn and soybean fields, um, you know, throughout the Midwest. And that in turn led to a big crash in the monarch population. And 
you know, I'm sure I'm sure folks know monarchs, they breed in the Midwest. Also, you know, others, you know, out to the East Coast and to the Rocky Mountains. There's another population in California. Um, <clears throat> But the Midwest is kind of their, their big breeding ground. And then in the fall, they go to Mexico where they overwinter and then come back the next year. And you know, this, this huge like devastation of milkweed because of Roundup and Roundup ready crops led to you know, a drastic decline. And this, you know, it's like at least 90% decline in the monarch butterfly population over the, over the past quarter century. Um, so just to you know, we wrote a report on this. We filed a petition with the Fish and Wildlife Service, which is the agency that administers the Endangered Species Act, or one of two that does that. And, you know, it took a while, as these things do, but the, you know, we presented good evidence, um, the, you know, oh, and we were petitioning the Fish and Wildlife Service to list monarchs as a threatened species, all right? And, you know, recently, just I forget when it was, what, maybe six months ago or a year ago, we finally got a response to that petition. And Fish and Wildlife said that monarchs deserve, you know, protected status under the law, but that <clears throat> it wasn't going to do it right away because there are other, you know, species ahead of it in the queue. And they're unfortunately overworked uh, at Fish and Wildlife. So, but basically, yeah, monarchs. They, you know, we have official acknowledgement from the government that they're threatened species. And, you know, with glyphosate being uh, a big, you know, one of the big causes of their decline. Thanks, Bill. Um, just for some housekeeping for those who've joined, um, you can pop your questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom. You can pop them in the chat, we're monitoring. Um, we appreciate so much the donations that folks have been making throughout this webinar. Um, you can just text stop pesticides to 707070. We're really grateful we couldn't do what we do without you. Um, I'm wondering, Andy or Amy, if you can tell us what is the status of glyphosate? We heard it got somehow pulled off the market in some way. Um, what work are we doing around glyphosate? And then where where is the chemical and where is it not? Just a couple of housekeeping things maybe before that, um, which is that 75% of all species on the endangered species list are there because of farming and ranching. Uh, so this is no small, you know, this is not some small percentage of those that are threatened. And I, I also want to underscore what Amy said before, because it's just so important, which is that we always have to remember is dangerous as these residues are. You know, you were talking about that, Ashley, you know, as dangerous as they are to our children, to our communities, to ourselves. The front line there are the farm workers, are the people who are working with those crops and with those pesticides, and often their families and their children are in those fields. So we, we certainly at CFS are committed to representing them, and they are, in, in our most recent case against glyphosate, I'm telling the EPA, you have to rescind the approval of this incredibly toxic chemical. We actually, as plaintiffs, have these workers, workers uh, groups of the, that represent these workers on our lawsuit. And that's something we intend to do more and more of. And I think it's just really critically important that whenever it reminds me of Cesar Chavez many, many years ago, for those of us who those were in my age group, who said, don't, don't buy anything in the supermarket like grapes or something without thinking of the people that pick them. How is their health? How's the education of their children? Uh, you know, let's, it's terribly important that, uh, that we always remember that as we move forward in our work and that social justice element, very, very important. Um, I also wanted to know, we, just so we have it down there, that 60% of our cropland, right now, around 60% of all of our cropland in the United States is devoted to genetically engineered corn, genetically engineered soy. And they don't feed anybody directly. They feed cars, <laughs> they feed animal factories, Right, both soy and corn shouldn't be eating those corn that those food anyway. They end up in high fructose corn syrup. They end up in soy lecithin. So this is a very dramatic dichotomy that most people aren't aware of in our agricultural system. We have an agro commodity system, which is simply selling crops as commodities to cars, right? Processed foods, and then we have an actually agricultural system that's actually making food. So I've always said in that regard that. We shouldn't 
pride ourselves in increasing yield, if we're increasing yield of something that doesn't feed anybody, destroys nature, creates endangered species, we should be talking about not yield per acre, but nutrition per acre. If the rest of the world adopted our agro commodity system and Monsanto and Bill Gates, a lot of people out there trying to make the world do just that, right? Where they're not spending their cropland on, sorry, using their cropland on crops, rather on these commodities that they can sell and, and, the, and, and the corporation can make money on, starvation would increase astronomically. So GMOs were never intended to solve the starvation problem. They create the starvation problem. And I'll hand over to, to Amy to talk about our current litigation on, on Roundup, uh, of which the, 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 the active ingredient is glyphosate. Yeah, and thanks for that sort of core framing, Andy, because I think it's important that folks understand um, where this is all coming from. Amy. Yeah, so um, in our current case against EPA, as I mentioned earlier, we, we are watchdogging them all the time for when they do these new approvals. Uh, under FIFRA, our federal pesticide law, they have to review existing pesticides every 15 years. So they do this registration review, which Congress included to say, look, the technology, you know, our science evolves, we learn more and more, you should review these pesticides to make sure they actually are still more beneficial than not, and that they're not causing, you know, harmful effects. So EPA has been engaged in doing that review for over a decade, 12 years, I think, uh, and, and, you know, it's taking a very long time. And then recently came out with this interim decision saying, we're done with uh, some of our assessment. We're gonna continue the registration, the use of glyphosate, uh, Roundup, you know, all the products. And uh, we're gonna continue to you know, work on these few things that we haven't actually finished up. So we challenged that decision because it was you know, a registration under the, under the statute. And one of the big things that they finalized was their human health risk assessment, which said that there is no risk to people's health from this pesticide. And specifically, there's no risk to people who encounter it at work. So as Andy was just saying, farm workers, as well as you know, groundskeepers and people that work in nurseries, you know, any kind of any kind of exposure are the are the front lines. They're the people who are around the spraying or who are even doing the spraying who are getting the most exposed to this. And EPA came to this conclusion, missing a lot of studies. You know, Bill is the, the expert on all the science there, um, but it was, a, it was just a ridiculous conclusion based on all the things we know about the harms of this specific pesticide, especially as we talked about earlier, the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, because that's the cancer that, you know, so many tens of thousands of people have developed after being exposed to glyphosate. And so there is a connection there, a very clear connection. And EPA just ignored this and said, nope, there's no cancer risk. There's no health risks of any kind. We're fine. So that's the, the case that I'm currently litigating. And uh, we just finished up the briefing in that case. And we're going to go to oral argument later in the year. I think actually, well, January of next year. And, uh, you know, I'm really proud that we're representing farm worker groups in that. And we've really made front and center the experience that they've had. Uh, and continue to have with these pesticides. And, you know, some of the, I mean, it, it's awful because a lot of times workers don't even know what they're getting sprayed with. Uh, glyphosate is very frequent. Uh, and they're afraid to say anything if they're not getting, you know, protective gear, uh, PPE, which they're often not. And because, you know, if you say something to your boss, you're just going to get fired. Um, you're just, there's going to be retaliation, you're going to lose your job. And so these folks are forced to choose between their health and having work. Um, some of the folks that we had um, do declarations for us in the case to explain you know, some of their injuries, um, Elvira is one and she works in a nursery in Florida. Um, she said she's had a lot of glyphosate exposure over the years and actually lost her six month old baby girl that she attributes to glyphosate exposure and knew another worker who also had a stillborn child. Uh, now she suffers from arthritis and uh, is getting harder and harder to work. And another woman, Edalia, um, also worked in a, also works in a nursery in the same in Florida as well, and developed Parkinson's from her glyphosate and other pesticide exposure, as uh, her neurologist actually confirmed. So now she not only can't work but can barely do any tasks around the house. Um, so it's it's certainly not uh, conjectural or, or or speculative. 
Uh, these harms are real. They're happening to people who put food on our tables every day, who also are suffering the most from the climate crisis, uh, heat waves, and the pandemic. And so, yeah, I just, I really hope that we can um, win in court for these folks who have so little voice in our system. And, th and there's that hypocritical thing, right, Amy and Ashley, you know, you mentioned Ashley, which is that under pressure, of course, Bayer slash Monsanto just announced that they're going to phase out all residential use of Roundup in 2023. So this is incredibly cynical because most of the people that are suing them for the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma that Amy was talking about are from residential people that worked as groundskeepers or that worked in, you know, uh, people who worked in various golf courses, that kind of exposure because they have the means and they have the educational, you know, abilities to say, oh yeah, I can sue on this. I can get money on this. But there's, Monsanto's basically saying, we don't care about the people that can't sue us. Let the farm workers die. Let them have those reproductive issues. We're going to say, we're going to phase it out to the ones that we know are going to sue us. The heck with the rest of them. It's one of the most cynical moves I've ever seen a corporation make saying, okay, you know, we don't care who it kills. We just want to make sure that the people that, that are going to sue us for these damages are, are not going to be able to do it anymore. Really remarkable. Yeah, because when, I, I, when Bayer acquired Monsanto, the shareholders realized, oh boy, you acquired some pretty big liabilities. So yeah, it's just a liability reducing feature, but um, certainly yeah, an Bayer, addition of danger. Bayer's lost two thirds of its stock value and it's billions and billions of dollars in debt because they didn't realize what a disastrous company they had Monsanto. There's another thing just quickly, and this is gonna be a huge battle, the coming battle, which is that, and Bill can also speak on this, the active ingredient around it, you know, glyphosate, right? is sometimes not the most dangerous part of Roundup. There's something called inerts, which can be incredibly dangerous. And many of these are called surfactants, which is uh, an addition to the formula that lets them stick to leaves and allows the, 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 the herbicide to work. And uh, we have a, a petition which they're going to have to answer, which says, EPA, you can no longer just look at the active ingredient of pesticides. You have to look at the whole formula that's harming our health. And, and the, the rest of the earth community. So this is gonna be a major battle. They're gonna to have to answer us, the Biden administration in the next few months. And of course, if they say, no, we refuse to look at the entire formula of pesticides that are creating these harms, um, then we, of course we'll litigate saying that the law doesn't allow you to make that kind of reductionist regulatory decision-making. You can't just decide what part of the pesticide you're gonna regulate and ignore that part, which is probably the most dangerous in most circumstances. Um, so that's gonna be, a revolution if we can win it in, in pesticide regulation where we'll actually force the EPA for the first time really to look at the entire formula of pesticides when, when making their regulatory decisions. Um, for folks who are tuning in, I, I encourage you to tune into the chat because there's tons of ways that you can get active right now um, to help our work in advancing these regulations and making sure that farm workers and everyday people are protected from these pesticides. And thanks to my colleagues, Joey and Brenna and Maria who run the back end of these things and do such an excellent job. Um, as someone who worked uh, very heavily here in Hawaii around chlorpyrifos um, and was very happy to see that the Biden administration was taking action on that insecticide. Can one of you comment on whether or not the Biden administration is, is an improvement um, from previous administrations when it comes to pesticide regulation? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I guess I can offer a few comments. I think the, um, basically at EPA, you know, it, they, EPA regulates a ton of different things. They have a lot of different divisions. The one that we deal with most often is the Office of uh, Pesticide Programs or OPP. And they unfortunately have a long history of, you know, siding pretty strongly with the, um, the companies that are making these products. It wasn't always that way. If you go back to the very early days of the EPA in the 70s and 80s, they there were some, you know, there was more courage. There was more courage to take tougher decisions to, you know, push back against the pesticide companies and their claims and their studies, which 
you know, in many cases had been proven fraudulent. Um, just as a sidelight, uh, as Amy can also tell you, under pesticide law, a lot of the data that EPA uses to make its pesticide decisions comes from the companies themselves, either studies that they themselves conduct or they commission. Um, but yeah, so it's, there hasn't been as much change as we would like to see with the, with the new Biden administration at the EPA. Um, there have been a few positive signs. They, for instance, admitted, um, the incoming administration admitted that, yes, the 2018 reapproval of dicamba uh, was uh, politically motivated. Um, unfortunately, they then did not apply that same reasoning to the most recent approval, which is the one that's active now that occurred in 2020. Uh, so, you know, that it was, that's, that's a little frustrating. The decision on chlorpyrifos uh, is, was, was a good thing. It's low hanging fruit, I would argue. It's, you know, under Obama's EPA, it was slated for, um, you know, uh, deregistration, which would have taken it off the market. Uh, so, you know, that there, been, I, I guess overall, there have been a few positive decisions, uh, low hanging fruit though, and not, not nearly as much change as we would like to see. Yeah, just a note on that, the, the Clopirifos uh, decision was forced by litigation. Uh, a judge, and Amy, am I right? The Ninth Circuit judge was a judge in the Ninth Circuit said, you got 60 days, by the way, this is never, I've never seen this in 35 years of litigation. The judge was so peeved at the delay on Kapiropos on, that he said, you got 60 days, six zero days to make this decision. So they were under absolute pressure from that court to make that Kapiropos decision. So I'm not sure how much credit we give the Biden administration. Mm. And at, at the risk of taking over the MC duty just for a minute, uh, that Ashley does always so brilliantly. Amy, would you maybe explain, I know this would be a little bit in the weeds for people. I think they really need to see a very clever tactic the Biden folks have done now to avoid all these major decisions that Amy was talking about where we have said, hey, you can't just rely on uh, the company's data. You've got to go out in the field and get the data. That was a tremendous victory we had in that camp for, for all future regulation. Well, they hadn't done it. So Amy, why don't you explain what they've done both admitting their failures and yet somehow uh, not taking these products off the market. How's that possible? Well, I assume you're referring to the cool new thing that the administration is doing where they ask for voluntary remand. Yep. So they go to court and they say, look, uh, we may have been wrong about this decision. So court, could you not actually make a decision and just send it back to us? We're gonna redo, we're gonna rethink it a little bit and then we'll come out with a new decision. And what typically happens in these is they just sort of shore up their reasoning. Uh, maybe they make some minor changes, but there's really no guarantee. And often it's just not gonna happen that they're actually gonna reverse the decision that they made before. What it does is it elongates the process, you know, and it may take away entirely our ability to get a, a court order saying, yeah, you acted illegally, you need to fix it. So it's um, an unfortunate tactic we've been seeing. We've been fighting back against it. Um, but I do want to say, you know, and I think we're going to get to this, that we've seen, I've seen a lot of questions in the Q&A and the chat about what regulatory reforms we're seeking and what legal reforms to federal law that we're seeking. So um, I don't know if, if, if Andy, if you want to talk about PACTPA um, or, I'm, and I'm happy to talk about our various petitions uh, where we're, we're trying to reform the process from the outset, um, not just suing when they fail to do it right. Oh, Andy, you're muted. Yeah, I think we on, on the chat, I think Emily, uh, who's working with Patrick, she can maybe get more information to people on what's happening. I think we're about to get that reintroduced by Senator Booker, who's been a very good player in this, by the way, folks, there are some heroes. Um, and so um, yeah, I, please look at the chat. It's gonna be, it's gonna be an ex it's exciting new bill in Congress, and we're gonna certainly be telling our members about it, and hopefully everybody here will know about it. You know, in this current Congress, the, the prospects of it passing because of the, you know, the Senate Republicans are small, but it's certainly a great educational tool for Congress. And eventually, if we can get, you know, one of these elections to turn around, we can get some of these passed. Um, 
but I think it's, yeah, we, we definitely, also this, as, as Ashley knows so well, we can do a lot of work as we've done in California and Hawaii and Oregon and Washington and other places. We can do a lot of work in county level. You know, sometimes the, the federal level isn't the best way to go. Sometimes it's much better to start working at these local levels as we have, including local litigation, but also local legislation that can make a tremendous difference. And uh, so that's always been a big part of our work is to make sure that we're doing the work we need to do at the local level. Uh, and quite often then that forces um, level at the federal level. And uh, by the way, just quickly, our two-pronged approach on GMOs to go back to the beginning, we have a two-pronged approach here, a strategy um, at CFS. One of them is to exactly what Amy is doing and, and our wonderful legal team, which is by rescinding the approvals of dicamba, of glyphosate, of 2,4-D, which is, these are all the herbicides that the GMOs depend on, right? This is what they've been genetically engineered to be tolerant to. The genetically engineered, they tolerate glyphosate. They tolerate dicamba. They tolerate 2,4-D slash glyphosate. Um, and if we take away those herbicides, the approval of those herbicides, there's no purpose for those GMOs. No farmer is going to buy them at a very high price seed because he can't even, he can't use the herbicide that's the lock and key that's supposed to make this technology happen. So that would be the end of 90 plus percent of all GMOs in this country, right there. So that's the relationship of our litigation to the end of GMOs, right? The end, the, the last battle, if you will. The other one, which is quickly, is the idea of labeling. Because of the local laws that we supported and spent years and years working on and that passed in Vermont, some other states, the federal you know, Congress took over and after a big battle, they passed a mandatory labeling law for GMO foods. Unfortunately, the regulations that came out of that by the Trump USDA were horrible. Uh, they allowed for non-package labeling where you'd have to put your cell phone or smartphone up against the packaging, try and get on a website, then try and figure out where that product was manufactured with GMOs or not. So that's obviously not practical. And 100 plus million people don't even have those smartphones, mostly the elderly and rural areas and, 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 and people in the poor areas of our country. So it's also highly discriminatory. So we're suing on that. No country that has had robust mandatory labeling has GMO foods on its shelves, none. And the reason for that is because GMOs offer nothing. They don't offer lower cost. They don't offer better nutrition. They don't offer better taste. They offer nothing except more herbicide risk through residue, right? So who in the world, once it's actually mandatory labeling, would ever buy a food that offers you zero, but only more risk? We can debate about how high that risk is, but there's some risk, right? So it's a failure in an informed marketplace, and that's why they fought labeling so hard. And we're right in the middle of that litigation right now saying, no, we, we want mandatory, robust, on-package labeling you have the right to know America. And when you do, and what they know is when we do, it'll be, that will also be the end of GMOs. So we take away over here, we take away the herbicides they depend on. Over here, we inform the public through mandatory labeling, and we call that the last battle. That is actually, either one of those will be sufficient to end this toxic and very, very dangerous experiment in our food that's gone on for the last 20 plus years. Thanks, Andy. Um, we are entering the final seven minutes of our call. If you haven't had the opportunity to uh, chat your questions into the Q&A function, please feel free to do that. And we've been trying to answer those um, on live for some of you. And you know, feel free to pop in any final questions that you might have. Um, and thanks to Emily, our policy manager, for helping explain some of the work we're doing both in Congress and at state legislatures to advance um, our work. I'd love to close it out. Um, if you guys could say, you know, something that you're really excited about in this coming year. Um, in terms of you know what we're working on and what victories you anticipate or hope for that might change the game around pesticides and how they're used in our food systems. Well, I'm happy to start that off because one of the things that I wanted to mention that um, in response to some of the questions as well in terms of how we're trying to change the regulatory and legal system. So in addition to supporting PACTPA, which Emily's putting all sorts of information in the chat 
to fix that federal pesticide law and make it better. We also have two pending petitions before the EPA. One is to get them to regulate the actual whole product that they approve, which the, we call the whole formula. So as Andy and, and Bill discussed, these, you know, uh, these products aren't just an active ingredient. They also include a lot of other ingredients, which make them more harmful a lot of the time because they make them work better. So uh, EPA well, does not, doesn't require testing of that actual product for a lot of the tests that they have that, you know, a pesticide maker has to run. So we said, that's ridiculous. You need to test the real pesticide. So that petition is pending. And then we also have a second petition to close a loophole for the seeds that are coated in neonics. That's the biggest use of these uh, neonicotinoid insecticides is on as a seed coating or seed treatment before the plant is even in the ground. And uh, EPA only looks at and approves that liquid product and doesn't actually look at the seeds themselves, which are now a pesticide, uh, now a pesticide delivery service. So uh, that's a giant loophole in the regulation. Uh, we did try to bring a lawsuit about it. And because EPA was squirrely enough and hadn't said anything clear enough, um, we weren't able to go forward with the lawsuit. So we have the petition. And um, so in the coming year, uh, we expect to get answers to those petitions one way or another. Um, yeah, it, that's, that, that's, that's really good, Amy. I'm also excited about those cases and their potential to really, you know, create, create major, you know, transformative change. I guess for me, you know, it's hard to choose, but, you know, uh, taking up our dicamba litigation again to kind of enforce this great decision we got from the court is, is really inspiring to me because I think we have, you know, obviously a, a very, very strong case. Um, and one of the things that excites me about it is, you know, CFS is a strong supporter of organic agriculture, which is, you know, ultimately what we, you know, believe in and want to, to promote. But we're also, you know, interested in, in, you know, helping farmers who maybe aren't ready for such transformative change, at least, you know, transition to more sustainable agriculture. And with that, the dicamba uh, victory, I think, and the dicamba situation, what we, we've made connections, I would say, to more, you know, mainstream ag players because dicamba has, is indiscriminate, right? It will harm an organic farmer. And we have organic farmers who um, have been involved in our case, but it also harms a lot of conventional farmers who, you know, have, you know, just been, I think, had their eyes opened about some of the uh, practices of the industrial agriculture and the uh, companies that they depend on for their seeds and pesticides. So I, I kind of see, yeah, the dicamba as an interesting, you know, issue in that it kind of can help us make inroads, I think, in uh, kind of mainstream um, farming communities and rural communities where maybe previously our, you know, stances, our positions, our messages haven't been so well received in the past. Yeah, I, I, um, I always think there's two jobs we have to do. And some of us do one or the other. They're both incredibly important. Some of us are able to do both. And one I always talk about is stopping the bleeding, stopping that GMO, stopping that pesticide, right? Stopping the bleeding out there, making sure that they, they cannot speed up the lines in, in these horrifying you know, animal factories. Um, and that's really important because unless we stop the bleeding, that could be the climate crisis, right? Agriculture is 35 or more percent of the, of the creation of greenhouse gases. We have to stop the bleeding, otherwise we won't make much left to say. We also need, need to change the consciousness that creates all this. You know, we have to, through our education, through awareness, through the promotion of agroecology and organic regenerative agriculture, which we do at CFS very strongly, an agriculture that is humane and socially just and biodiverse and appropriate scale and local. That new food future is really important to get that concept through. And I think a really important paradigm shift, and um, I wrote about this, and maybe we can put this in the, in the chat at some point, is to understand that the whole term pesticides, everything we're talking about in the last hour is actually a misnomer. It's actually a euphemism because it leads to the idea that somehow these pesticides, these chemicals can, are only killing pests. They're only killing you know, some pests, some weeds, some specific insect or fungi. That is not the case. Uh, these are biocides. They kill birds and they kill bees and they kill butterflies and they kill fish and they kill babies and they kill us. 
um, that war against nature is a war against ourselves. And this spring will be the 60th anniversary of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. And in her last two pages, she says that. She says, this is Neanderthal biology what they're using because these are biocides. And I think that sort of frames our entire work. We understand that not just as a threat to ourselves, but a threat to the entire earth community. And this from soil microbes to humans, uh, they're biocides. And so when we talk about them, we should talk about biocidal chemicals. And these biocidal chemicals lead to ecocide. And as we know, 75% of the endangered species are there because of farming and ranching. So I think, you know, we stop the bleeding it and, and, and understand that this is a absolutely critical battle against these biocides. But we also change the consciousness and let people understand that there's this new food future, which is already out there. It's happening in Hawaii, it's happening in the mainland, it's happening everywhere of a new regenerative organic food future. And it's just as important that we fight for that as we fight against uh, these biocides and their the ubiquitous use of them in industrial agriculture. Thanks, Sandy. And that's a beautiful way to close us out. Um, thank you again to everybody who joined us today. Thanks to Amy and Bill um, for just your really daily hard work and grind on these issues. It is amazing to be on a team with folks who work so hard every day. Um, and we couldn't do what we do without our donors. And so thank you to the folks who donated live today. And for those who are our regular donors, we're, we're just so grateful to be able to do what we do. Again, we do all of this litigation without charging the communities um, that we represent in court. Um, and that's because of you. Uh, make sure to stay engaged and stay involved. Um, there's been a ton of action alerts pasted in the chat. Uh, and thanks to Brenna, Maria, and Joey, who you might not see their faces, but this is all of their hard work that makes these webinars possible. Um, so I hope you guys have a wonderful day. Please share the alerts after you sign them, says Joey. Um, that share function has become uh the currency of this uh, this moment in our democracy so we appreciate you guys sharing what we do with your friends and family uh thanks again and i hope you have an awesome day thank you ashley hey happy to do it yes